on 5 December 1915, representatives of the Allied powers gathered at the French headquarters in Chantilly to discuss plans for the coming year. The meeting came to the conclusion that the minor fronts that had been opened in places such as Salonika and the Middle East would not be reinforced and that the focus would be on mounting coordinating offensives around Germany and Austria-Hungary in Europe. The goal of these offensives was to prevent the Central Powers from shifting troops to defeat each offensive in turn. In other words, they wanted to force the Central Powers to commit as many soldiers to a certain front to stop them from committing soldiers to other theatres and fronts of the war. This was part of a strategy known as War of Attrition, which entailed a prolonged period of conflict during which each side seeks to gradually wear down the other by a series of offensives. On the Western Front, General Joseph Joffrey and the new commander of the British Expeditionary Force, or the BEF, General Sir Douglas Haig, debated strategy. While Joffrey initially favoured several smaller assaults, Haig desired to launch a major offensive in Flanders, Belgium. After much discussion, the two decided on a combined offensive along the Somme River, with the British on the north bank and the French on the south. Though both armies had suffered major casualties in 1915, they had succeeded in raising large numbers of new troops, which allowed the offensive to move forward. Most notable of these were the 24 new army divisions formed under the guidance of British War Secretary Lord Kitchener. Also known as Kitchener's Army or Kitchener's Mob, the new army was initially an all-volunteer army of the British Army. It volunteered on the recommendation of Kitchener to raise... It originated on the recommendation of Kitchener to raise 500,000 volunteers. Kitchener's original intention was it would be formed and ready to be put into action by mid-1916, but circumstances dictated its use before then. Comprised of volunteers, the new army units were raised under the promise of those who joined together would serve together. As a result, many of the units were comprised of soldiers from the same towns or localities, leading to them being referred to as chums or pals battalions. Due to the huge numbers of men wishing to sign up, in some places queues were more than a kilometer formed outside recruitment offices, there were many problems in equipping and providing shelter for the new recruits. Rapidly, the government added many new recruitment centers, which eased the admissions burden and began a program of temporary construction at the main training camps. Almost 2.5 million men volunteered for Kitchener's army between 1914 and 1916. By the beginning of 1916, the queues were not as long. Information about the true brutality of the war had reached Britain and patriotic and militaristic enthusiasm had plummeted. Thus, the British government had to resort to conscription under the Military Service Act of 1916. Interestingly, conscription not only forced men to join the military, but also forced certain men not to join. Skilled workers and craftsmen who had volunteered early in the war could be drafted back into the munitions industry where they were sorely needed. Meanwhile, the central powers were planning an offensive strategy of their own in an attempt to win a decisive victory that would end the war. While Austrian Chief of Staff, Count Konrad von Hotzendorf, made plans for con attacking Italy through the Trentino Offensive on the border between Austria and Italy, his German counterpart, Erich von Falkenhayn, was looking to the Western Front. Falkenhayn incorrectly believed that the Russians had been effectively defeated the year before after the Goris Tarno Offensive. So he decided to concentrate Germany's offensive power on knocking France out of the war, knowing full well that with France out of the war, Britain would be forced to negotiate for peace. To do so, he sought to attack the French at a vital point along the front. He planned to attack the French there where they would not be able to retreat from due to issues of strategy and national pride. As a result, 
he intended to compel the French to commit to a battle that would bleed France white. Falkenhayn selected Verdun as the target of his operation. Verdun was relatively isolated in a salient that pushed out into the German lines. The French could only reach the city over one road, while it was located near several German railheads. Dubbing the plan Operation Gericht or Judgment, Falkenhayn secured Kaiser Wilhelm II's approval and began massing his troops. A fortress town on the Meuse River, Verdun protected the plains of Champagne and the approaches to the French capital Paris. Surrounded by rings of forts and batteries, Verdun's defences had been weakened in 1915 as artillery was shifted to other sections of the line. Falkenhayn intended to launch his offensive on 12 February, but it was postponed for nine days due to poor weather. Alerted to the attack, the delay allowed the French to reinforce the city's defences. Surging forward on 21 February, the Germans succeeded in driving the French back, feeding reinforcements into the battle including French General Philippe Pétain's 2nd Army. The French began to inflict heavy losses on the Germans as the attackers lost the protection of their own artillery. In March, the Germans changed tactics and assaulted the flanks of Verdun at the Mod Homme and Cote or Hill 304. Fighting continued to rage through April and May, with the Germans slowly advancing, but at massive cost. Meanwhile, as fighting raged at Verdun, seeds of rebellion were being sown in the British territory of Ireland. The Acts of Union 1800 united the Kingdom of Great Britain and the Kingdom of Ireland as the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, abolishing the Irish Pol Parliament and giving Ireland representation in the British Parliament. From early on, many Irish nationalists opposed the Union and the ensuing exploitation and impoverishment of the island. This led to a high level of depopulation. Opposition took various forms. Firstly constitutional, such as the Repeal Association, the Home Rule League. Secondly, there was the social factor, such as the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland the land and the Land League. And then thirdly, a revolutionary factor, such as the Rebellion of 1848 and the Fenian Rising. The Irish Home Rule Movement sought to achieve self-government for Ireland within the United Kingdom. In 1886, the Irish Parliamentary Party, or the IPP, under Charles Stuart Parnell, succeeded in having the first Home Rule Bill introduced in the British Parliament, but it was defeated. The second Home Rule Bill of 1893 was passed by the House of Commons, but rejected by the House of Lords. After the fall of Parnell, younger and more radical nationalists became disillusioned with parliamentary politics and turned towards more extreme forms of separatism. The Gaelic Athletic Association, the Gaelic League and the Cultural Revival under W.B. Yeats and Augusta Lady Gregory, together with the new political thinking of Arthur Griffith expressed in his newspaper Sinn Féin and organizations such as the National Council and the Sinn Féin League led many Irish people to identify with the idea of an independent island. This was sometimes referred to by the generic term Sinn Féin. The third Home Rule Bill was introduced by British Liberal Prime Minister H. H. Asquith in 1912. Irish Unionists, who were overwhelmingly Protestant, opposed it as they did not want to be ruled by a Catholic-dominated Irish government. Led by Sir Edward Carson and James Craig, they formed the Ulster Volunteers, or the UVF, in January 1913. In response, Irish nationalists formed a rival paramilitary group, the Irish Volunteers. In November 1913, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or the IRB, was a driving force behind the Irish Volunteers and attempted to control it. Its leader was Owen McNeill, who was not an IRB member. 
The Irish Volunteers stated goal was to secure and to maintain the rights and liberties common to all the people of Ireland. It included people with a range of political views and was open to all able-bodied Irishmen without distinction of creed, politics or social group. Another militant group, the Irish Citizen Army, was formed by trade unionists as a result of the Dublin lockout of that year. When the Irish volunteers smuggled rifles into Dublin, the British Army attempted to stop them and fired into a crowd of civilians. British Army officers then threatened to resign if they were ordered to take action against the UVF. By 1914, Ireland seemed to be on the brink of a civil war. This seemed to be averted in August of that year by the outbreak of the First World War and Ireland's involvement in it. Nevertheless, on 18 September 1914, the Government of Ireland Act 1914 was enacted and placed on the statute book, but the Suspensory Act was passed at the same time, which deferred Irish Home Rule for one year, with powers for it to be suspended for further periods of six months, so long as the war continued. It was widely believed at the time of the war that the, that the war would not last more than a few months. On 14 September 1915, an order in council was made under the Suspensory Act to suspend the Government of Ireland Act until 18 March 1916. Another such order was made on 29 February 1916, suspending the Act for another six months. The Supreme Council of the IRB met on 5 September 1914, just over a month after the British government had declared war on Germany. At this meeting, they decided to stage an uprising before the war ended and to secure help from Germany. Responsibility for the planning of the rising was given to Tom Clark and Sean McDermott. The Irish volunteers set up a headquarters staff that included Patrick Pierce as Director of Military Organization, Joseph Plunkett as Director of Military Operations, and Thomas McDonough as Director of Training. Eamon Kent was later added as Director of Communications. In May 1915, Clark and McDermott established a military committee or military council within the IRB consisting of Pierce, Plunkett and Kent to draw up plans for a rising. Clark and McDermott joined it shortly after. The military council was able to promote its own policies and personnel independently of both the volunteer executive and the IRB executive. Although the volunteer and IRB leaders were not against the rising in principle, they were of the opinion that it was not opportune at that moment. Volunteer Chief of Staff Owen McNeill supported a rising only if the British government attempted, attempted to suppress the volunteers or introduce conscription, and if such a rising had some chance of success. IRB President Dennis McCullough had prominent IRB member Balmer Hobson held similar views. The military council kept its plans secret so as to prevent the British authorities learning of the plans and to thwart those within the organization who might try to stop the rising. IRB members held officer rank in the volunteers throughout the country and took their orders from the military council and not from McNeil. Shortly after the outbreak of World War I, Roger Casement and Clan Nagale leader John Devoy met the German ambassador to the United States, Johann Heinrich von Bernstorff, to discuss German backing for an uprising. Casement went to Germany and began negotiations with the German government and military. He persuaded the Germans to announce their support for Irish independence. In November 1914, Casement also attempted to recruit an Irish brigade made up of Irish prisoners of war who would then be armed and sent to Ireland to join the uprising. However, only 56 men volunteered. Plunkett joined Casement in Germany the following year. Together, Plunkett and Casement presented a plan, the Ireland Report, in which a German expeditionary force would land on the west coast of Ireland while an uprising in Dublin diverted the British forces. The 
German military rejected the plan, but agreed to ship arms and ammunition to the volunteers. James Connolly, head of the Irish Citizen Army, or the ICA, a group of armed socialist trade union men and women, was unaware of the IRB's plans and threatened to start a rebellion on his own if other parties failed to act. If they had done it alone, the IRB and the volunteers would possibly have come to their aid. But the IRB leaders met with Connolly in January 1916 and convinced him to join forces with them. They agreed that they would launch an uprising together at Easter and made Connolly the sixth member of the military council. Thomas McDonough would later become the seventh and final member. The death of the old Fenian leader Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa in New York in August 1915 was an opportunity to mount a spectacular demonstration. His body was sent to Ireland for burial in Glasnevin Cemetery with the volunteers in charge of arrangements. Huge crowds lined the route and gathered at the graveside. Pierce made a dramatic funeral oration, a rallying call to Republicans which ended with the words, Ireland unfree shall never be at peace. In, April, in early April 1916, Pierce issued orders to the Irish volunteers for three days of parades and maneuvers beginning on Easter Sunday. He had the authority to do this as the volunteers director of organization. The idea was that RRB members within the organization would know that these were orders to begin the rising, while men such as McNeil and the British authorities would take it at face value. On 9 April, the German Navy dispatched the SS Libau for the Irish coast, disguised as the Norwegian ship Ode. It was loaded with 20,000 rifles, 1 million rounds of ammunition and explosives. Casement also left for Ireland aboard the German submarine U-19. He was disappointed with the level of support offered by the Germans and he intended to stop or at least postpone the rising. On Wednesday, 19 April, Alderman Tom Kelly, a Sinn Féin member of Dublin Corporation, read out at a meeting of the corporation a document purportedly leaked from Dublin Castle detailing plans by the British authorities to shortly arrest leaders of the Irish Volunteers. Sinn Féin and the Gaelic lead and occupy their premises. Although the British authorities said the castle document was fake, McNeil ordered the Volunteers to prepare to resist. Unbeknownst to McNeil, the document had indeed been forged by the military council to persuade moderates of the need for their planned uprising. It was an edited version of a real document outlining British plans in the event of conscription. That same day, the military council informed senior volunteer officers that the rising would begin on Easter Sunday. However, it chose not to inform the rank and file or moderates such as McNeil until the last minute. The following day, McNeil got wind that a rising was about to be launched and threatened to do everything he could to prevent it. McNeil was briefly persuaded to go along with some sort of action when McDermott revealed to him that a German arms shipment from the Ord was about to land. McNeil believed that when the British learnt of the shipment, they would immediately suppress the volunteers. Thus, the volunteers would be justified in taking defensive action, including the planned maneuvers. The Ord and the U-19 reached the coast of Kerry on Good Friday, 21 April. This was earlier than the volunteers expected and so none of them were there to meet the vessels. The Royal Navy had known that the armed shipment and intercepted the Ord, prompting the captain to scuttle the ship. Furthermore, Casement was captured shortly after he landed at Banner Strand. When McNeil learned that the arms shipment had been lost, he reverted to his original position. With the support of other leaders of like mind, he issued a countermand to all volunteers, cancelling all actions for Sunday. This countermanding order was relayed to volunteer officers and printed in the Sunday morning newspapers. It succeeded only in delaying the rising for a day, 
although it greatly reduced the number of volunteers who turned out. British naval intelligence had been aware of the armed shipment, casements return and the Easter date for the rising, though no radio messages between Germany and its embassy in the United States that were intercepted by the Royal Navy and deciphered in room 40 of the Admiralty. The information was passed to the Under Secretary for Ireland, Sir Matthew Nathan, on 17 April, but without revealing its source, and Nathan was doubtful about its accuracy. When news reached Dublin of the capture of the Ord and the arrest of Casement, Nathan conferred with the Lord, Lord Lieutenant Lord Wimborne. Nathan proposed to raid Liberty Hall, headquarters of the Citizen Army, and volunteer properties at Father Matthew Park and at Kimmage, but Wimborne insisted on wholesale arrests of the leaders. It was decided to postpone action until after Easter Monday, and in the meantime, Nathan telegraphed the Chief Secretary, Augustine Burrell, in London, seeking his approval. By the time Burrell cabled his reply authorizing the action, at noon on Monday 24 April 1916, the Easter Rising had already begun. On the morning of Easter Sunday 23 April, the Military Council met at Liberty Hall to discuss what to do in light of McNeil's countermanding order. They decided that the Rising would go ahead the following day, Easter Monday, and that the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army would go into action as the Army of the Irish Republic. They elected Pierce as President of the Irish Republic and also as Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Connolly became Commandant of the Dublin Brigade. Messengers were then sent to all units informing them of the new orders. On the morning of Monday 24 April, about 1,200 members of the Irish Volunteers and Irish Citizen Army mustered at several locations in central Dublin. Among them were members of the all-female Kuman Namban. Some wore Irish Volunteer and Irish and Citizen Army uniforms, while others wore civilian clothes with a yellow Irish Volunteer armband, military hats and bandoliers. They were armed mostly with rifles, especially 1871 Mausers, but also with shotguns, revolvers, a few Mauser C-96 semi-automatic pistols and grenades. The number of volunteers who mobilized was much smaller than expected. This was due to McNeil's countermanding order and the fact that the new orders had been sent so soon beforehand. However, several hundred volunteers joined the rising after it began. Shortly before midday, the rebels began to seize important sites in central Dublin. The rebels' plan was to hold Dublin city centre. This was a large oval-shaped area bounded by two can canals, the Grand to the south and the Royal to the north, and the River Liffey running through the middle. On the southern and western edges of this district were five British army barracks. Most of the rebels' positions had been chosen to defend against counter-attacks from these barracks. The rebels took the positions with ease. Civilians were evacuated and policemen were ejected or taken prisoner. Windows and doors were barricaded, food and supplies were secured and first aid posts were set up. Barricades were erected on the streets to hinder British army movement. movement. A joint force of about 400 volunteers and citizen army gathered at Liberty Hall under the command of Commandant James Connolly. This was the headquarters battalion and it also included Commander-in-Chief Patrick Pearce, as well as Tom Clark, Sean McDermott and Joseph Plunkett. They marched to the General Post Office, or the GPO, on O'Connell Street, Dublin's main thoroughfare, which occupied the building and hoisted two Republican flags. Pearce stood outside and read the proclamation of the Irish Republic. Copies of the proclamation were also pasted on walls and handed out to bystanders by volunteers and newsboys. The GPO would be the rebels headquarters for most of the rising. Volunteers from the GPO also occupied other buildings on the street, including buildings overlooking O'Connell Bridge. They took over a wireless telegraph station and sent out 
a radio broadcast in Morse code, which announced that the Irish Republic had been declared. This was the first radio broadcast in Ireland. Rebels also attempted to cut transport and communication links. As well as erecting roadblocks, they took control of various bridges and cut telephone and telegraph wires. Around midday, a small team of volunteers and Fianna Iran members swiftly captured the magazine fort in the Phoenix Park and disarmed the guards. The goal was to seize weapons and blow up the ammunition store to signal that the rising had begun. They seized weapons and planted explosives, but the blast was not big enough to be heard across the city. A contingent under, under Sean Connolly occupied Dublin City Hall and adjacent buildings. They attempted to seize neighbouring Dublin Castle, the heart of British rule in Ireland. As they approached the gate, a lone and unarmed police sentry, James O'Brien, attempted to stop them but was shot dead by Connolly. According to some accounts, he was the first casualty of the rising. The rebels overpowered the soldiers in the garrison but failed to press further. The, Brit the British Army's Chief Intelligence Officer, Major Ivan Prince Price, fired on the rebels while the Under Secretary for Ireland, Sir Matthew Nathan, helped shut the castle gates. Unbeknownst to the rebels, the castle was lightly guarded and could have been taken with ease. The rebels instead laid siege to the castle from City Hall. Fierce fighting erupted there after British reinforcements arrived. The rebels on the roof exchanged fire with soldiers on the street. Sean Connolly was shot dead by a sniper, becoming the first rebel casualty. By the following morning, British forces had recaptured City Hall and taken the rebels prisoner. The rebels didn't attempt to take some other key locations in the heart of the city centre and were defended by only a handful of armed Unionist stu students. Failure to capture the telephone exchange in Crown Alley left communications in the hands of government with GPO staff quickly repairing telephone wires that had been cut by the rebels. The failure to occupy strategic locations was attributed to lack of manpower. In at least two incidents at Jacobs and Stevens Green, the volunteers and citizen army shot dead civilians trying to attack them or dismantle their barricades. Elsewhere, they hit civilians with their rifle buds to drive them off. The British military were caught totally unprepared by the rebellion and their response of the first day was generally uncoordinated. Two troops of British cavalry were sent to investigate what was happening. They took fire and casualties from rebel forces at the GPO and at the four courts. As one group of soldiers approached the GPO, the rebels opened fire killing three cavalrymen and two horses, and fatally wounded a fourth man. The cavalrymen retreated and were withdrawn to barracks. On Mount Street, a group of volunteer training corps men stumbled upon the rebel position and four were killed before they reached a nearby barracks. The only substantial combat of the first day of the Rising took place at the South Dublin Union, where a group from the Royal Irish Regiment encountered an outpost of Eamon Kent's force at the northwestern corner of the South Dublin Union. The British troops, after taking some casualties, managed to regroup and launch, a several, uh, launch several assaults on the position before they forced their way inside and the small rebel force in the tin huts at the eastern end of the Union surrendered. However, the Union complex as a whole remained in rebel hands. A nurse in uniform, Margaret Kirk, was shot dead by British soldiers in the Union. She is believed to have been the first civil civilian killed in the Rising. Three unarmed Dublin Metropolitan Police were also shot dead on the first day of the Rising and their commissioner pulled them off the streets. Partly as a result of the police withdrawal, a wave of looting broke out in the city centre especially in the area of O'Connell Street. Lord Wimborne, the Lord Lieutenant, declared martial law on Tuesday evening and handed over civil power to Brigadier General William Lowe. British forces initially put their efforts into securing the approaches to Dublin Castle 
and isolating the rebel headquarters which they believed was in Liberty Hall. The British commander, though, worked slowly, unsure of the size of the force uh, he was up against and with only 1,269 troops in the city when he arrived from the Kara camp in the early hours of Tuesday, 25 April. City Hall was taken from the rebel unit that had attacked Dublin Castle on Tuesday morning. In the early hours of Tuesday, 120 British soldiers with machine guns occupied two buildings overlooking St. Stephen's Green, the Shelbourne Hotel and United Services Club. At dawn, they opened fire on the citizen army occupying the Green. The rebels returned fire but were forced to retreat to the Royal College of Surgeons building. They remained there for the rest of the week, exchanging fire with British forces. Fighting erupted along the northern edge of the city centre on Tuesday afternoon. In the northeast, British troops left Amiens Street railway station in an armoured train to secure and repair a section of damaged tracks. They were attacked by rebels who had taken up position at Annesley Bridge. After a two hour battle, the British were forced to retreat and several soldiers were captured. At Phibsborough, in the northwest, rebels had occupied buildings and erected barricades at junctions on the North Circular Road. The British summoned 18 pounder field artillery from Athlone and shelled the rebel positions, destroying the barricades. After a fierce firefight, the rebels withdrew. That afternoon, Pierce walked out into O'Connell Street with a small escort and stood in front of Nelson's pillar. As a large crowd gathered, he read out a manifesto to the citizens of Dublin, calling on them to support the rising. The rebels had failed to take either of Dublin's two main railway stations or either of its ports at Dublin Port and Kingstown. As a result, during the following week, the British were able to bring in thousands of reinforcements from Britain and from the garrisons at the Curragh and Belfast. By the end of the week, British strength stood at over 16,000 men. Their firepower was provided by field artillery, which they positioned on the north side of the city of Phibsborough and at Trinity College, and by the patrol vessel Helga, which sailed up the Liffey River having been summoned from the port of Kingston. On Wednesday, 26 April, the guns at Trinity College and Helga shelled Liberty Hall and the Trinity College guns then began firing at rebel positions, first at Bolland's Mill and then in O'Connell Street. Some rebel commanders, particularly James Connolly, did not believe that the British would shell the second city of the British Empire. The principal rebel positions at the GPO, the Four Courts, Jacob's Factory and Bolland's Mill saw little action. The British surrounded and bombarded them rather than assault them directly. One volunteer in the GPO recalled, We did practically no shooting as there was no target. However, where the insurgents dominated the routes by which the British tried to funnel reinforcements into the city, there was fierce, fierce fighting. On Wednesday morning, hundreds of British troops encircled the men the city institute, which was occupied by 26 volunteers under Sean Houston. British troops advanced in the building, supported by snipers and machine gun fire, but the volunteers put up stiff resistance. Eventually the troops got close enough to hurl grenades to the building, some of which the rebels threw back. Exhausted and almost out of ammunition, Houston's men became the first rebel position to surrender. Reinforcements were sent to Dublin from Britain and disembarked at Kingstown on the morning of Wednesday, 26 April. Heavy fighting occurred at the rebel-held positions around the Grand Canal as these troops advanced towards Dublin. More than 1,000 Sherwood foresters were repeatedly caught in a crossfire trying to cross the canal at Mount Street Bridge. 17 volunteers were able to severely disrupt the British advance, killing or wounding 240 men. Despite there being alter alternative routes across the canal nearby, General Lowe ordered repeated frontal assaults on the Mount Street position. The British eventually took the position, which had not been reinforced by the nearby rebel garrison at Bowen's Mill on Thursday.
but the fighting there inflicted up to two-thirds of their casualties for the entire week for a cost of just four dead volunteers. It had taken nearly nine hours for the British to advance 270 meters. On Wednesday, Linehall Barracks on Constitution Hill was burnt down under the orders of Commandant Edward Daly to prevent its reoccupation by the British Army. The rebel position at the South Dublin Union, site of the present-day St James Hospital, and Maribyrn Lane, further west along the canal, also inflicted heavy losses on British troops. The South Dublin Union was a large complex of buildings and there was vicious fighting around and inside the buildings. By the end of the week, the British had taken some of the buildings in the Union, but others remained in rebel hands. British troops also took casualties in unsuccessful frontal assaults on the Maribyrn Lane Distillery. The third major scene of fighting during the week was in the area of North King Street, north of the Four Courts. The rebels had established strong outposts in the area, occupying numerous small buildings and barricading the streets. From Thursday to Saturday, the British made repeated attempts to take the area in what was some of the fiercest fighting of the Rising. As the troops moved in, the rebels continually opened fire from windows and behind chimneys and barricades. At one point, a platoon led by Major Shepard made a bayonet charge on one of the barricades, but was cut down by rebel fire. The British employed machine guns and attempted to avoid direct fire by using makeshift armored trucks and by breaking through the inside walls of terraced houses to get near the rebel positions. By the time of the rebel headquarters surrender on Saturday, the South Staffordshire Regiment under Colonel Taylor had advanced only 140 meters down the street at a cost of 11 dead and 28 wounded. The enraged troops broke into houses along the street and shot or bayonet bayoneted 15 unarmed male civilians whom they accused of being rebel fighters. Elsewhere, at Portobello Barracks, an officer named Bowen Colthurst summarily executed six civilians, including the pacifist nationalist activist Francis Sheehy Skeffington. These atrocities against Irish civilians would later be highly controversial in Ireland. The headquarters garrison at the GPO after days of shelling was forced to abandon their headquarters when fire caused by the shells spread through the GPO. Connolly had been incapacitated by a bullet wound to the ankle and had passed command on to Pierce. Thay O'Reilly was killed while trying to escape from the GPO. They tunneled through the walls of the neighboring buildings in order to evacuate the post office without coming under fire and took up a new position. The young Sean McLaughlin was given military command and planned to break out but Pierce realized this plan would lead to further loss of civilian life. On Saturday 29 April from the new headquarters Pierce issued an order for all companies to surrender. Pierce surrendered unconditionally to Brigadier General Lowe. The surrender document read in order to prevent the further slaughter of Dublin citizens and in the hope of saving the lives of our followers now surrounded and hopelessly outnumbered, the members of the provisional government present of headquarters have agreed to an unconditional surrender and the commandants of the various districts in the city and county will order their commands to lay down arms. The other posts surrendered only after Pierce's surrender order reached them. Sporadic fighting therefore continued until Sunday, when word of the surrender was passed to the other rebel garrisons. Irish volunteer units mobilized on Easter Sunday in several places outside of Dublin, but because of Owen McNeill's countermanding order, most of them returned home without fighting. In addition, because of the interception of the German arms aboard the Ord, the provincial volunteer units were very poorly armed. In the south, around 1,200 volunteers mustered in Cork under Thomas McCurtain on the Sunday, but they dispersed on Wednesday after receiving nine contradictory orders by dispatch from the volunteer leadership in Dublin. 
At their headquarters, some of the volunteers engaged in a standoff with British forces. Much to the anger of many volunteers, McCurtain, under pressure from Catholic clergy, agreed to surrender his men's arms to the British. In the north, volunteer companies were mobilized in County Tyrone at Colsey Island, including 132 men from Belfast, led by RRB President Dennis McCullough, and Carrickmore under the leadership of Patrick McCartan. They also mobilized at Creasler, County Donegal under Daniel Kelly and James McNulty. However, in part because of the confusion caused by the countermanding order, the volunteers in these locations dispersed without fighting. In Fingal, or North County Dublin, about 60 volunteers mobilized near Swords. They belonged to the 5th Battalion of the Dublin Brigade, also known as the Fingal Battalion, and were led by Thomas Ash and his second in command, Richard Mulkey. Unlike the rebels elsewhere, the Fingal Battalion successfully employed guerrilla tactics. They set up camp and Ash split the battalion into four sections. Three would undertake operations, while the fourth was kept in reserve, guarding camp and foraging for food. The only large-scale engagement of the Rising outside the Dublin city was at Ashbourne. On Friday, about 35 Fingal volunteers surrounded the Ashbourne Royal Police Barracks and called on it to surrender, but the police responded with a volley of gun gunfight. A firefight followed and the police surrendered after the volunteers attacked the building with a homemade grenade. Before the surrender could be taken, up to 60 royal policemen arrived in the convoy sparking a 5 hour gun battle in which 8 policemen were killed and 18 wounded. Two volunteers were also killed and 5 wounded and the civilian was fatally shot. The police surrendered and were disarmed. Ash led them, let them go after warning them not to fight against the Irish Republic again. Ash's men camped at Kilsalan near Dublin until they received orders to surrender on Saturday. The Easter Rising resulted in at least 485 deaths according to the Glasnevin Trust. Of those killed, 260, about 54% of the total, were civilians. 126 were British forces, 82 were Irish rebel forces, 17 were police, more than 2,600 were wounded, including at least 2,200 civilians and rebels, at least 370 British soldiers and 29 policemen. All 16 police fatalities and 22 of the British soldiers killed were Irishmen. About 40 of those killed were children under 17 years old, four of whom were members of the rebel forces. The majority of the casualties, both killed and wounded, were civilians. Most of the civilian casualties and most of the casualties overall were allegedly caused by the British Army. This was due to the British using artillery and incendiary shells and heavy machine guns in built up areas as well as their inability to discern rebels from civilians. One Royal Irish Regiment officer recalled they regarded, not unreasonably, everyone they saw as an enemy and fired at anything that moved. Many other civilians were killed when caught in the crossfire. Both sides, British and rebel, also shot civilians deliberately on occasion for not obeying orders, and also assaulting or attempting to hinder them, and for looting. There were also instances of British troops killing unarmed civilians out of revenge or frustration. Furthermore, there were incidents of friendly fire. On 29 April, the Royal Dublin Fusiliers under Company Quartermaster Sergeant Robert Flood shot dead two British officers and two Irish civilian employees of the Guinness Brewery after he decided they were rebels. Flood was court-martialed for murder but acquitted. According to the historian Fergal McGarry, the rebels attempted to avoid needless bloodshed. Desmond Ryan stated that volunteers were told no firing was to take place except under orders or to repel attack. Aside from the engagement at Ashbourne, policemen and unarmed soldiers were not systematically targeted. 
The vast majority of the Irish casualties were buried in Clasnevin Cemetery in the aftermath of the fighting. British families came to Dublin Castle in May 1916 to reclaim the bodies of British soldiers and funerals that were arranged. The British, under General Maxwell, quickly signalled the intention to arrest all dangerous Sinn Féiners, including those who have taken an active part in the movement, although not in the present rebellion. Reflecting the popular belief that Sinn Féin a separatist organization that was neither militant nor republican was behind the, resizing, the rising. A total of 3,430 men and 79 women were arrested, including 425 people for looting. A series of court martials began on 2nd of May, in which 187 people were tried, most of them at Richmond Barracks. Controversially, Maxwell decided that the court martial would be held in secret and without a defense, which Crown law officers later ruled that this was illegal. Some of those who conducted the trials had commanded British troops involved in suppressing the rising, a conflict of interest that the military manual strictly prohibited. Only one of those tried by court martial was a woman, Constance Mekovich who was also the only woman to be kept in solitary confinement. 90 were sentenced to death. 15 of those, including all seven signatories of the proclamation, had their sentences confirmed by Maxwell and 14 were executed by firing squad between 3 and 12 May. Among them was the seriously wounded Connolly, who was shot while tied to a chair because of his shattered ankle. Maxwell stated that only the ringleaders and those proven to have committed cold-blooded murder would be executed. However, the evidence presented was weak and some of those executed were not leaders and did not kill anyone. As the executions went on, the Irish public grew increasingly hostile towards the, Brit towards the British and sympathetic to the rebels. After the first three executions, John Redmond, leader of the moderate Irish Parliamentary Party, said in the British Parliament that the rising happily seems to be over. It has been dealt with, with with firmness, which was not only right, but it was the duty of the government to so deal with it. However, he urged the government not to show undue hardship or severity to the great masses of those who are implicated. As the executions continued, Redmond pleaded with Prime Minister H. H. Asquith to stop them, warning that if more executions take place in Ireland, the position will become impossible for any constitutional party. Redmond's deputy, John Dillon, made an impassioned speech in Parliament, saying thousands of people who ten days ago were bitterly opposed to the whole of the Sinn Féin movement and to the rebellion are now becoming infuriated against the government on account of these executions. He said, It is not murderers who are being executed. It is insurgents who have fought a clean fight, a brave fight, however misguided. Dillon was subsequently heckled by English MPs. The British government itself had also become concerned at the reaction of the executions and at the way of the courts martials were being carried out. Asquith had warned Maxwell that a large number of executions would sow the seeds of lasting trouble in Ireland. After Connolly's execution, Maxwell bowed to pressure and had the other death sentences commuted to prison sentences. But not all were so lucky. Sir Roger Casement was tried in London for high treason and hanged at Pentonville Prison on the 3rd of August. The aftermath of the rising and in particular the British reaction to it, helped sway a large, a large section of Irish nationalist opinion away from hostility or ambivalence and towards support for the rebels of Easter 1916. Dublin businessman and Quaker James G. Douglas, for example, wrote that his political outlook changed radically during the course of the rising because of the British military occupation of the city and that he became convinced that parliamentary methods would not be enough to remove the British presidents. 
The Easter Rising would go a long way in setting in motion a sequence of events that would eventually lead to the independence of a section of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland would still remain British and still remain so today.